Hello, Abuses from around the world. My name is Kais and I'm 12 years old and I live in Montreal, Canada. Welcome to our Abut Zoom session where me and my brother and co-host, Zaid, who is 15 years old, will be interviewing our guest change maker, Bas Dijkstra. Bas is from the Netherlands. He is the co-founder of Lazy Vegan, a company that promotes a plant-rich diet by creating delicious vegan ready meals. Bas's work links to several sustainable development goals, especially to goal number two, zero hunger, goal number three, good health and well-being, and goal number 13, which is climate action. Zaid and I will ask questions to Bas about his background, his journey, his work, his skills, and his impact. So Zaid, do you want to ask the first question? Yeah, sure. So how big do you think like the vegan market is just like as food wise or like across the world? Like, do you think it matches with other food companies which are not vegan, like the market size or not? Uh, vegan uh, is growing enormously, but I think it's it's a tiny bit of society that is uh, uh, fully fully plant based. I think it will be one to two percent worldwide, and um, but it's growing and uh, it's still niche. There's um, there's a lot of people that cut down on meat, but really cutting down on eggs and milk and every animal ingredient. Um, that's that's for many people still too much, and uh, yeah, so it's a niche, but it's growing really fast. Nice. Right. So on Project Drawdown Research, they rank plant-rich diets as one of the most effective climate solutions. Is this why you started Lazy Vegan? Um, I became aware that plant-based food is indeed good for for the climate, or indeed like eating meat is really impactful for the for the for the planet and um so th this other guy my co-founder he started lazy vegan and uh, i joined him and uh but I think one of the big motivations is indeed that that the climate problem we've got together and uh and i think i can make impact by uh, making people enthusiastic about our delicious meals which are fully plant-based yeah. Okay. What do you think motivates people like the most to become vegan? Like the main thing that people see and they're like, oh, I want to turn vegan after seeing it. I think um, there are three motivations for people. The first is, um, is an egoistic one where people see their own performance and their health improves when you start cutting down on meat and milk and, and, and animal uh, proteins. Um, that's mainly like masculine sporty people that start to realize it. They watch the game changers on Netflix and they really get affected directly like, oh, oh I'm also going to cut down. And so top sporty people. Um, so that's one um, uh, motivation. The second motivation is animal welfare. And you see a lot of traditionally left um left people th those were perceived as, 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 as soft by the majority of society but i think it's really true they believe that you shouldn't uh, you should take care of, of animals and the current industry that we produce meat is really terrible and also how we produce milk and eggs it's really not at the level you want to treat animals as uh, as we should and then the second uh, or the third motivation is a climate one we start to realize that the impact of um, uh, yeah, creating a lot of animal ingredients as food uh, costs is really inefficient versus eating the plants yourself. So those three are, uh, are, 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 are the key motivations. I think for the majority of people, the climate, um, the climate is the most convincing for the bigger group. And especially at the moment where we have like real climate problems or at least how people realize. Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. So are you on a vegan diet? And if so, when and why did you become vegan? Yeah, good question. Um, when I started uh, to join uh, my co-founder, that's two and a half years ago, I, st I was still eating animal ingredients. So meat, eggs, milk, everything. And uh, because I also wanted to understand how the normal consumer group would would be would be because the flexitarians, the majority of people, like I said, only one to two percent is vegan. But um, 
I started to experiment by cutting down meat, so I became a vegetarian uh, in terms of diet. But sooner uh, or later, I, I started to cut down all animal ingredients. And so for almost a year now, a bit longer, uh, we don't eat any, any animal ingredients at all. And um, at the start, I felt more vital, really like those, like I could do anything, really energetic. And, uh, and now it's more like a normal way of life. And, um, and my motivation at the start was, was also performance based. But it's now, it has moved. Uh, climate always, but also animal welfare. I'm, 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 I can't even, uh, I don't even dare to eat meat again. And uh, because it feels really terrible somehow. So um, yeah, almost longer than a year now. Okay. Do you target certain age groups when you advertise your, your company? Or is it just yeah, absolutely, absolutely. We see a lot of, uh, so you're 15, uh, actually at that age, we see a lot of uh, girls becoming aware of uh, the animal welfare stuff. So a lot of girls start at that age to become even, even younger uh, uh, with the motivation of animal welfare to start a vegetarian diet. Uh, then the student group, they're uh, not even becoming vegetarian, they directly become vegan. And uh, because they realize the animal welfare is bigger, the climate problem is also uh, created by the milk production, egg production, everything. So the younger audience is really aware. Uh, when you talk, when I talk to my mom and uh, she's like 72, her generation is less aware. And they, they, they're more like, okay, I always eat I, I've always eaten meat in my life. Why should I cut down? And they get the thing of climate, but it's it's difficult to change behavior, uh, especially uh, when you look at when I look at myself. Like you, you, you set yourself objective objectives to change behavior, but in reality, it's it's only five percent of your objectives that you can change. So, and even on the food side, that that's even harder. And um, but we see more and more people becoming, uh, becoming, or at least uh, I always say becoming vegan. I like to say uh, adopting a, a vegan, a vegan diet. Uh, yeah. And we target as a, a, we've got a proposition, which is, um, have you seen the website? No. Yeah. No? Oh, you did, uh, guys. And. Um, yeah. So, so you might have seen that it's uh, it's it's a meal uh, with 100% natural ingredients. It's frozen, and uh, you throw it literally in the pan, and then you start to stir fry for eight minutes, and you've got a delicious uh, you've got a delicious meal. And um, when you start to cook and you want to create like vegan recipes, it's it's often difficult for people to start from scratch because they don't know where to start. They're so used to using milk or or eggs or meat in, 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 in the thing they create. And we make it easy for them to, to eat vegan. And we've added the lazy part because you don't have always time and fun to cook or uh, you're just too busy. And everyone wants to be lazy once in a while in the kitchen. So, um, so we, we've added the laziness to the vegan bit and uh, came up with the name Lazy Vegan. Okay. So it's so on your website it says no animals, no soy, no hassle. What does the no no soy mean? The no soy bit. Yeah, a lot of the um, um, a lot of the meat substitutes. Do you know? Do you sometimes eat meat substitutes? No. So a fake burger think. or a fake sausage or um, mm -hmm. no. not real meat. So most of them are produced with soy as an ingredient. And um, a lot of the vegan uh, people, they eat a lot of soy because soy is used as an alternative for milk, as an alternative for meat. Um, and we've come across a lot of them and they had like, they were so relieved that our product didn't have soy. We got like a meat substitute, a chicken substitute, which is made of pea protein. So green peas, those little green um, peas, 
we take the protein out and we put it in some kind of uh, uh, meat texture. And, um, and it's really tasty and it comes with a lot of protein because you need protein if you don't need meat. And um, so the noise soy bit comes from uh, the fact that we love our own pieces which are made of pea protein. Um, but it has the, the benefit that a lot of vegans eat too much soy. And uh, some of them, a tiny part of them, are soy allergic. And there is some climate issues with soy, because if you replace, if you want to produce soy, uh, you need to cut trees because um, uh, you need land to produce it. And, um, but the bigger thing with soy is that because we eat so many cow, and uh, we, we feed them with soy. If we cut down the uh, meat consumption, especially cow, then we don't have to produce so many soy for the animals. So we have a lot of spare land over then, which we can use for soy, which we can consume ourselves. And um, yeah, so we, we pronounce that like no soy because in the target group, it's, it's a relief. Our product comes without soy. How many times do you eat a meal from your company, like a week or a month? <laughs> it's uh, when I'm in the company now with Corona, I'm eating more, uh, working more from home, but usually uh, I think um, every second day. And uh, so three to four times a week as a lunch, as a lunch. Yeah. And uh, yeah, we've got loads of them uh, in the office. So, so that works. Uh, yeah. Okay, so how are the ready meals at Lazy Vegan prepared? How are they prepared? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so my co-founder, he's, he's a really good uh, chef in the kitchen, Vincent, and he loves to cook. And uh, so he's combining uh, different ingredients. He's creating like a sauce. And um, for instance, we've got a tikka masala meal, an Asian meal. And... Um, so he's composing those meals and uh, then we're testing them first ourselves and uh, friends around us. And if everyone likes them, then we start to uh, purchasing the different ingredients and the ingredients come uh, frozen. So after the harvest, they're directly frozen and we compose them. They're all individual products and they get together in a uh, production location. And the thing we do there is, is pack them uh, fully frozen and uh, then there's frozen transport to to the supermarket and uh, when you buy it in the supermarket you put it in your own freezer at home and uh, positive thing about the frozen element is that uh, once you harvest vegetables and you directly freeze them it's um, in terms of food waste you can keep them for uh, for a long time uh, almost a year a bit longer even and um, so you can use them when you when you need it, and it's not it's not perishable uh, as fast as as non frozen stuff. Uh, so from a food waste perspective, it's 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 also uh, sustainable. Um, so, how would you think it compares to like having a vegan diet, to like having your own farm where you just treat those animals well, and then at the end, like they die of old age, and then you like use them as food like would it be as eco-friendly like to have a vegan diet or run your own farm by yourself and use the plants there and animals there uh, i'm not against farming at all um and um i like the, the the i like animals and i like little farms and it, it sounds really romantic and uh when i visit farms uh with my kids i i love it and um so keeping your own farms like we did in the past eh, before uh, agriculture started um, is not per se negative or such. Um, it's the overproduction that we've created with the growing population and uh, the monoculture. Also farmers get more specialized in cows or in chicken or in pigs. And before they did a lot of activities on their own farm, uh, they even created uh, or produce vegetables, they had like chickens, they had like diverse range of activities. And, and that was more in balance. And uh, there was also some circularity on, on farms. 
um, but th that's really lost now in the in the current efficiency um, uh, ambition over the last uh, decades. Um, I think it's in the end when you ask me like how does the future look like? I think there will be more green little local farms. Um, it will be more in balance. Um, more, more people will eat plant based. Um, also organically grown vegetables. Um, and when we all start to eat more plant based, there is less uh, land being used for uh, cattle food. And uh, so cows, we don't have to produce corn and, uh, and soy for, for the cows and the pigs uh, anymore. So it's far more efficient. We can give also a lot of land back to the wild, to wildlife. And uh, you might have seen David Attenborough's uh, uh, documentary on Netflix. And uh, the fast reduction of, of wildlife over the last decades is really terrible what's happening. And it's, it's mainly due to us eating a lot of meat and using a lot of land to produce food for that specific cow and pigs. And um, it's not logic. And uh, so I think it will be a combination of both, like getting more local and uh, balanced farms with indeed a couple of chicken, a couple of cows, a couple of pigs, uh, and also the farmer growing vegetables and planting trees and creating biodiversity on, on, on the farm uh, in combination with uh, uh, a population that should be veganized. Otherwise, climate-wise, it's not, it's not going to work. Okay. I know how you said that the food is instantly frozen after the harvest. Doesn't that consume energy and, commit and emit carbon? Yeah. That's true, yeah, and um, and that's 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 the choice we make in the process. And uh, the thing I'm gonna do, I'm gonna trace uh, the CO2 impact from indeed like harvest to um, to fork. And uh, I haven't done that yet, but when you look at the food waste um, of normally uh, of normal grown vegetables and how that perishes over time and how fast it perishes over time um, it might be more uh, co2 proof but i still need to do the exercise so that's an excellent question thanks for triggering that okay. hmm. so what advice do you have to other young people who want to become entrepreneurs like you in the future uh that's 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 a good question. Um, I think you, you, the thing is like education, I don't know what you guys are doing in terms of education, but um, it should, it could move more to uh, uh, experimentation, uh, learning by doing, um, learning by doing research rather than just uh, uh, learn stuff which you don't practice. And um, uh, I see a lot of uh, uh, educational systems moving also the direction of like, guys, come on, let's do experiments and, and try to start something that people might need or make impact. Um, and so I, I already see your generation as being more entrepreneurial than mine. Um, also stimulated by the education system. Um, I don't have one specific advice. The, 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 the only advice I've got is like, uh, uh, don't feel um, uh, influenced by what other people think of you. And don't start something because you think other people will like you then. Uh, or join a company because other people will think positively about you. So don't think about what other people think of you. Even if you have an unconventional idea or a stupid idea that you think is right, follow your dreams and, and try it. Try it out. And, and, and if you fail, fail fast. And uh, so you learn and you can use those learnings again for the next experiment. And, uh, and the world needs a lot of experiments because we've got a lot of problems to solve. And 
yeah, so don't be afraid and don't think about what other people think of you, just do it. And uh, it's easily said, uh, but um, yeah, try to be a bit unconventional and follow your dreams. That's That would be my advice. Okay, so I, this is my last question. Who inspires you? Uh, the, I think you do. And uh, the fact that you're like 12 and 15, and, and, and calling uh, like entrepreneurs and innovative people all over the world and asking them what they do and, and how they think, the, the level of curiosity is enormous. And uh, I'm inspired by people that, that are curious and uh, that do some kind of double click and have some kind of open mind and uh, don't judge, but ask and try to understand, trying to listen and try to uh, walk in the shoes of someone else for a while to understand how does other people think. And uh, yeah, and, and I think the, the, the big trap is that at some stage in your life, you might lose your open mind. And uh, I think the people that don't, I feel inspired by, by those people, I think. Okay, so Zid, do you have any more questions? No, that's it. Okay, so well, I'm gonna end it off here. So thank you, Bus and Zaid, for the great discussion and for all the things that we learned today. And thank you, Boozers, for listening to this interview. Make sure to follow us on Instagram and Twitter and to subscribe to our YouTube channel so you can hear about upcoming sessions with other change makers. Please also tell your friends about Aboot and share our social media links with them. And last but not least, go to aboot.co to learn about opportunities to collect digital badges and help us draw down carbon. Super cool.